online or offline, during the beginning of any first period class, we start off with the phrase, good morning. And we say this phrase almost out of habit to our peers, teachers, and parents, like a polite yet obligatory hello. To be honest, we don't really think about its meaning. Because when someone says a screen to you, you only find it natural to say it back to this person who greeted you, whether you really had a good morning or not. And so I ask you, did you really have a good morning today? I had a good morning today because I woke up knowing that today I'd be given this rare opportunity to speak to y'all. I felt excited for the first time in a while. And I can tell you right now, it's very hard to find mornings quite as good these days. Because on the weekdays, by 7.30, really the first thing I would have to look at and continue looking at is my screen. And I'm not just saying this casually. I really do have to if I don't want to be tardy for class. I need to if I want to see all of the new emails that I got from school that day. And there's also the fact that I constantly receive text messages from my friends between classes every now and then. And even if I just want to scroll for the internet to find the latest news or to check any updates on the COVID-19 cases around the world. And of course, Netflix and YouTube are no exception. So either way, it would just be me sitting away hours in front of my computer all the way through lunch to the afternoon till early evening. Because usually when I'm not on Zoom, I'd be working on all my latest assignments, projects, studying for my test, and I suppose that's just how it is in high school. I can't deny that we do get busier. But the day after that would go by the same way, and the day after that and so forth, until it seems like there's not a time in the day when I'm really offline. And this seemingly monotonous, endless cycle just keeps going on and on until suddenly a year has passed by, a year in which I've nearly been confined in my own house. So it's inarguable that gradually the effects of this online cycle starts to press down on me as my eyes start to sting from looking at the screen constantly, and my mind starts to feel stressed and fatigued. I would feel tired by afternoon. My sleeping patterns would be off at night, and there would be days when I feel like an empty shell or a blank piece of paper. In case you haven't noticed yet, which hopefully you did, there's an inherent problem here, because my daily routine consists of continuous online work, repetitive poor habits, and an addiction to my devices. The gap between my virtual and physical reality is winding. My priorities are off, and I'm slowly but surely losing control of my mental grasp. But it's not as if I can stop being online. Because in this particular time, being online is what makes me connected to society. It's what makes all of us connected to society. Even now, in this exact moment in time, you being online enables me to connect with you right now. Without knowing it, the screen had become my closest window to the outside world, when the actual outside world itself had become irrelevant to me. The occurrence of the worldwide pandemic has by far created a new uncommon routine for the whole of society, one that shouldn't be normal, but has only become more and more so with the passing of time. And as much as I constantly worry that I or the people around me may get COVID-19, what scares me, just the same right now, is being unable to bridge this mental gap online. How am I supposed to keep my mind in check at a time when it seems like we're all living in our own chrysalis, when people have essentially become each other's fear? And it would be a lie if I say that social distancing does not shift the grasp we have on our mental health. And as much as I constantly worry, and the current, uh, and I can guarantee that all of us students, even those who have or still are cherishing this experience of being at home, have at least at one point after being online thought about wanting to return back to school for whatever reason that may be. 
all of us could agree on the fact that when we first encountered the pandemic, we were desperate to go outside and we missed simple things like not having a mask cover over half our faces, eating out in the open, meeting up and socializing with friends, or just going to the movie theater on a Friday evening. And I find it fascinating how fast humans are truly able to adapt because the biggest difference that we have between now and then is that the prospects of interacting online has increased drastically as people are slowly losing their skills to communicate as they find other alternatives. Humans were meant to be social beings, and despite all of the mental stress and social anxiety we are receiving due to being online, we have started to fear and push away the actual idea of human-to-human -human communication even more. And I say this because when students are given the choice to turn on or off their cameras during class, nowadays, they seem to choose the latter. Unlike before, when teachers have told us to be quiet, they're now pleading to us to say something, to talk, and to go on mute. And while this would have been a very appealing option for us before the pandemic, this doesn't really seem to be the case now. Furthermore, it was due to all of these factors combined that I started realizing the importance of our mental well-being in our daily lives, the ways it could affect us, whether we are online or offline. How can we maintain a healthy mind, both in this new pandemic and outside of it, is the main question that I came to ask myself over these past couple of months. And asking this question repeatedly to myself was what finally triggered my inspiration for the book that I wrote last semester for my creative writing class, The Good Advisor. all that talking just to get to here. And as you could see, this book is frankly just a book. But let me tell you, I only slept an average of three to five hours towards the very last week of this writing project. And on my very final day of writing, I didn't sleep at all. So while this book may not be that special to you, I have poured and carved my soul into this writing project during the past month of November. So yes, it is very special to me. Especially when, through this novel, I feel that I was given the opportunity to write for others who shared my problems and concerns with mental health at this time. And some of these, and on a smaller scale, these people that I got to share my story with could be my classmates at GIS or my family members. But on a larger scale, it could also be my friends back in Korea, as well as my old teacher living in Uganda, who in turn showed it to some of her students and her close friends. Now, truth be told, this realistic fiction novel is a collection of short stories on different mental disorder patient cases all put together, meaning it isn't directly COVID-19 related. However, if I wrote this story correctly, it still conveys the importance of needing to speak up when we face psychological distress, that we don't need to, that we shouldn't feel shame in seeking help for our mental health. And it was due to this message that I even decided to mention about this work in my speech today. Because by the end of this novel's writing process, I was able to answer my months-long question of how I can maintain a healthy mind both in this pandemic and on, offline. Because this message was the answer to it. I want to pause here, and I want everyone to think about this. When we're physically ill, we try to do what we can to get better, whether that's by going to the doctor, getting some rest, or getting some kind of medication. And this is only natural for us as it should be. And so my question is, why shouldn't this be the same for mental aspects? Our minds are the most valuable parts of ourselves because it's where our true characteristics lie, making it the biggest part of our identity. And yet, those who face these types of mental disorders are often stigmatized because of the common misconceptions that people have. To give an example, when a person says they have a doctor's appointment, relatively, other people seem to take it in quite naturally. On the contrary, if they say, I have a therapy session, so much more assumptions tend to be made because of the common misconceptions that people have. And some of these misconceptions could be that people, um, people who attend therapy are mentally weak, unstable, in a bad place, 
don't have solid relationships or are wasting their money. And these ideas generally come from the lack of understanding or fear, especially with misleading and inaccurate media representations of mental illnesses these days. But overall, it's because of these kind of ideas that discrimination and stigmas based around the concept of mental health are created. And the problem with this is that the effects of these stigmas can be very harmful because they bring in a sense of isolation, shame, and hopelessness for those who have or still are struggling through this difficulty. But worst of all, it also creates a reluctance to ask for help or to get treatment in severe cases. And I feel sorry that society has created this false mindset because it's completely fine to ask for help when it comes to maintaining this essential part of ourselves. It means you want to develop more self-awareness. It's self-care. Connecting to that idea, this is where I get to speak a little bit more about my book. And I'm going to try and give a very brief synopsis of one of my patient cases. So during my fourth patient case, I wrote about this story. I wrote that this story of this patient who is a pathological liar, meaning that this patient has the habitual or compulsive behavior of lying, and the more and more she says them, the more she believes it's true. Consequently, this led her to live with another person's ID for years. She tricked her family, friends, all those that are close to her, but most importantly, she tricked herself. And in the end, it was all of her lies that caught up to her. And it was because she was unwilling to meet the truth that she encountered the problems that she had. I feel like this is really similar to what we're doing to ourselves when we try to ignore what's going on in our mental health conditions. We're forcing ourselves to think that we're OK when we might need help. And if this help is not given in time, then we're only bound to feel more anxious, fresh, and frustrated until we reach the certain breaking point. And I notice this happens both online and offline, but especially with this online routine, it's so much harder to know when people are struggling mentally, not unless they say it out loud. Just from last semester, my class received nearly three to four well-being surveys to see how we're adjusting online. And when the results came out for high school, I noticed that only a very small percentage of people said they felt completely well or happy with their online school routine. Instead, judging from the numbers, I noticed that a lot of people said they felt stress about school, COVID-19, or other few issues revolving around their personal life. And as much as these results sparked my interest, they caught me by surprise just the same. Because whenever I go into my Zoom classes and I see my classmates, I can't tell whether they're feeling sad, happy, distressed, angry through their screens. But I know that those results that I saw didn't come from anywhere. They would have come from at least one or two people from my class, people that I know. Just as we're quicker to react when we're physically ill, we also have a faster way of knowing it whether that's through the different symptoms that are occurring in our body or a tangible injury that we can actually feel. And this is a tricky thing about our brains is that a while brought to mind can't be perceived by the human eye. And therefore, it's so important for us to know when to admit to ourselves that we're hurting. Don't just push it aside. Give yourself the time, but try to face it directly. And this will be the hardest part of the process. Sometimes it's not a physical or palpable solution that cures our problems. Instead, it's generally the idea of stepping out and pushing aside societal expectations to ask for help when necessary, even if it might be looked down upon. Now, to progress a little bit more further, the next step is to try and find someone who will listen to you but find a person whom you could trust and openly talk to. In a different case example in my book, there's another patient who has dissociative identity disorder caused by a traumatic experience. But even more so than the experience itself, what caused him to be hurt further throughout the process was not having enough courage to speak up when he needed to. And when he finally did, having the person he trusted brush aside and disregard his problem, 
even as I wrote this story, I knew that if there had just been better communication and understanding between these two characters, things wouldn't have gone as bad as it did. And so I'm telling you, choose wisely. Maybe a close family member or friend. But whoever that may be, make sure that you know they will take consideration into your words with care. And there's a high chance that they will not have the exact solution to your problem, but just spelling out what's going on in your mind can lift away a huge portion of your worries. And as time passes by, you're likely to find out that most of the people around you go through your similar experiences and problems. And at times, it's okay to feel overwhelmed by these emotions. But the most important thing that you have to do then is to be honest to yourself. Admit how you're feeling and try to find a way out of that. Now, what I'm suggesting may seem like an obvious solution that all of us have heard of at least once or twice before in our lives. And if you do think this, may I ask, how many people do you think actually follows along with it? I admit, it seems straightforward, it seems simple, but that just makes it easier for us to push it aside. So don't just ignore, because when we do this, our struggles pile up one after another. There's a reason why these solutions are said time and time again. We expect solutions to unsolvable issues to be groundbreaking when they could just be overlooked for their simplicity. But besides that, there are also other simpler ways to invest time in your mental well-being, whether that's through talking with your friends or family, arranging time in your schedule to do some hobbies that you enjoy doing, or just getting enough exercise and sleep each day. One that helped me a lot for the pandemic was having a journal to write down the small things that I'm thankful for each day, things I normally would have taken for granted. Spending this time and effort into your mental well-being is one of the most proficient investments that you can make. And upon the circumstance that we are in, it's the best and only way in which we can maintain our mental aspects. Even before the pandemic, we have been faced with this problem of needing to maintain a healthy mind without easily being able to express our mental concerns. But being able to look carefully into your heart so you could evaluate how you feel each day is the building bridge to your mental well-being, regardless of being online or offline, whether we are in or out of this pandemic. Find a way to express yourself. Just as you take care of the body, take care of the mind. Thank you.